Hello everybody, this is Dr. Nadeem and we are with Neelam Path Lectures, the Pursue series. As you are aware, all our lectures are available on YouTube. We have a Telegram group which you can join where all the lecture related information is available. We have a Google Drive where the PDF of all lectures are available. These are the disclaimers. This is phase 3 which is recorded pathology lectures. And today we have Pursue 7x which is neuropathology and we are streaming from IPGMR Kolkata. And the topic of the day is gliomas and glioneural tumors. And to talk on that, we have Dr. Srishti Bhutta, who is an MBBS Honors Gold Medalist, MD Pathology, Demonstrator in the Oncopathology Unit of the Department of Pathology, IPGMER and SSKM Hospital, Kolkata. She's got 12 publications in national and international journals. Her special interest is neuropathology, molecular genetics, and hematopathology. With this, I would request Dr. Srishti Bhutta to start her talk on gliomas and glioneural tumors. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. A very good evening. Today we will be discussing about gliomas and glioneuronal tumors. So gliomas, glioneuronal tumors and neuronal tumors will be discussed with specific emphasis on WHO CNS5. Diffuse gliomas that have been divided into the adult type and the pediatric types will be discussed separately and in details. Nomenclature and grading of adult type diffuse astrocytomas will be done. Pediatric type low grade and high grade diffuse gliomas will also be discussed. In addition, there will be a discussion on ependymomas, neuronal and glioneuronal tumors. So let's start. There has been a paradigm shift with the emergence of next generation sequencing techniques paving a way forward for the classification of gliomas from a genetic standpoint. The discovery of isocytrate dehydrogenase mutations, that is the IDH mutations in gliomas have led to a refinement in the diagnostic scheme of diffuse gliomas. The latter, that is the diffuse gliomas can be precisely classified into astrocytic and oligodendroglial tumors using IDH, TP53, ATRX, and 1P19Q co-deletion studies. So enlisting the specific changes in gliomas and glioneuronal tumors. Gliomas and glioneuronal tumors have been divided into six different families and 14 newly recognized types have been added to the classification in WHO CNS5. Division of diffuse gliomas that primarily occur in adults have been named as adult type diffuse gliomas and those occurring primarily in children or the pediatric age group have been termed as the pediatric type diffuse gliomas. So classifying gliomas, glioneuronal tumors and neuronal tumors according to the WHO CNS5. First, gliomas. Gliomas can be either adult type diffuse gliomas or the pediatric type diffuse gliomas. When we consider the adult type diffuse gliomas, they can either be astrocytoma, IDH mutant, right? Okay. Or it can be the oligodendroglioma, IDH mutant and 1P19Q co-deleted. Or for that matter, it can be a glioblastoma, IDH wild type. When we consider the pediatric age group, we have pediatric diffuse low grade gliomas and pediatric diffuse high grade gliomas. Now, pediatric diffuse low-grade gliomas can be diffuse astrocytoma, MYB or MYBL1 altered, angiocentric gliomas, plenty, that is polymorphous low-grade neuroepithelial tumor of young, diffuse low-grade gliomas, MAPK pathway altered, right? Now, pediatric diffuse high-grade gliomas can either be H3K27M altered, H3 G34RV mutant or diffuse pediatric type high grade glioma H3 wild type IDH wild type. It can also be an infant type hemispheric glioma. Moving on, circumscribed astrocytic gliomas have been added in the recent WHO and pilocytic astrocytoma has been incorporated into this group. Right. So in this group, we have pilocytic astrocytoma, pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma, subependymal giant cell astrocytoma or the SEGA, cordoid glioma, astroblastoma, MN1 altered. 
right? So now ependymal tumors, now these can either be the supratentorial ependymomas or it can be the posterior fossa ependymomas or for that matter spinal ependymomas. Now supratentorial ependymomas can either have a ZFTA fusion or a YAP1 fusion. Posterior fossa ependymomas can have, be, uh, have been grouped either as PFA or PFB types, right? Spinal ependymomas either shows an MYCN amplification or it might be a case of a mixopapillary ependymoma which typically occurs in the corda equina. Note, subependymoma has no uh, site predilection so it can occur either in the supratentorial posterior fossa or the spinal locations per se. Moving on to the glioneuronal and neuronal tumors which have been divided into either ganglioglioma, desmoplastic infantile ganglioglioma, Disembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumor or the DNET, okay, diffuse glioneuronal tumor with oligodendroglioma like features and nuclear clusters, papillary glioneuronal tumor, rosette forming glioneuronal tumor, myxoid glioneuronal tumor, diffuse leptomeningeal glioneuronal tumor, gangliocytoma, multinodular and vacuolating neuronal tumor central neurocytoma and cerebellar liponeurocytomas. So now coming to the concept of liats. What are liats? Liats are nothing but long-term epilepsy associated tumors. Compared to the adult counterparts, the pediatric diffuse gliomas generally have a prolonged clinical course and that results in characteristic drug resistant epilepsy. Therefore, these tumors have been grouped as LIATs, that is long-term epilepsy associated tumors. There are several glioneuronal tumors which have also been incorporated under this heading. Okay. It must also be noted that pediatric diffuse gliomas often lack the characteristic genetic mutations that have been associated with their adult counterparts, that is IDH mutations and 1P19Q co-deletions which are usually absent in pediatric diffuse gliomas. So now coming to the characteristic genetic difference between the pediatric type diffuse glioma and the adult type diffuse glioma. If we see the pediatric counterpart, we see that the pediatric type diffuse gliomas can either be low grade or high grade. Now if there is a genetic difference between the two, then what is that? The genetic difference is that the RAS MAPK pathway is altered in diffuse pediatric low grade gliomas whereas the diffuse pediatric high grade gliomas usually affect the histone or the H3 pathway. Specifically the H3K27M mutations or the H3G34RV mutations are affected in pediatric high grade gliomas. The RAS MAPK pathway on the other hand are characteristically affected in the pediatric low grade gliomas. This is unlike the adult counterparts okay which show a characteristic mutation affecting the idh pathway or the 1p19q co-deletions as seen in oligodendroglioma but a unique example is a high grade cerebral astrocytoma that occurs typically in infants that harbors receptor tyrosine kinase or the rtk fusion including the ntrk family fusions okay so that is typically very very important to note so this is the only one which is a unique case. So what do we see in this figure here? So we see that uh, there is a characteristic diagrammatic representation of uh, pediatric type high grade and low grade gliomas, right? The pediatric type high grade gliomas can be either a diffuse hemispheric glioma affecting the cerebral hemisphere harboring the H3G34RV mutation. It can also be a diffuse midline glioma where there is a mutation affecting the H3K27M. On the other hand, it can also be an infant type hemispheric glioma where there is a mutation characteristically uh, affecting the receptor tyrosine kinase pathway. On the other hand, the pediatric type uh, astrocytomas, that is the low grade ones, or the pediatric type oligodendrogliomas usually harbor mutations in the FGFR1 or the PRAF V600E. There are several other low-grade gliomas like the angiocentric glioma affecting the MYBQK1 or the plenty that affects the MAPK pathway. 
So other diffuse cerebral high-grade gliomas and glioblastoma like histology without IDH or H3 mutations can be grouped under the umbrella designation of a diffuse pediatric high-grade glioma. Okay, so uh, that is also to be noted. So if uh, you have a cerebral high-grade glioma with a glioblastoma like histology but lacking any IDH mutations or H3 mutations per se, then that can typically be classified as a diffuse pediatric type high-grade glioma. So if these mutations are lacking. But there is a characteristic glioblastoma like histology. So now coming to diffuse hemispheric glioma, now that characteristically affects the cerebral hemispheres and occurs typically in children and young adults, right? So it is to be noted that this tumor uh, shows a characteristic high-grade morphology, okay, with high-grade nuclear features or it may be showing a CNS embryonal tumor-like morphology for that matter. There is a high mitotic activity, microvascular proliferation and or necrosis may be present. But it must be noted that even if these features are lacking for that matter, but it is showing a characteristic mutation affecting the H3G34RV pathway, then that confers a diagnosis of a CNS WHO grade 4 glioma. That is, presence of this mutation, irrespective of the morphology, upgrades the tumor to a CNS WHO grade 4 glioma. Now coming to the diffuse midline glioma, what do you see here? You see a characteristic pontine mass that is identified here. What about the histological feature? What do you see? What can you make out here? It is showing an astrocytoma-like morphology. There is a characteristic uh, presence of H3K27M protein that has been highlighted by the IHC here. And there is a characteristic loss of H3K27ME expression, right? And so this qualifies as a diagnosis of a CNS WHO grade 4 glioma, okay? So, and that is referred to as a diffuse midline glioma. But what is to be noted? That this tumor characteristically affects the midline location, the brain stem, thalamus, and spinal cord, often associated with H3K27M mutation. So even if it uh, does not harbor the anaplastic morphology per se, it can still be upgraded to a CNS WHO grade 4 glioma if it shows a characteristic mutation of H3K27M. In addition, it must be noted that this tumor predominantly affects the children, but cases have been reported in adults as well. Now coming to plenty, what is this? Now this is a polymorphous low-grade neuroepithelial tumor of young, right? So this, yes, you can make out that this is a CNS WHO grade 1 tumor. Okay, why? Because it is a diffuse pediatric low-grade glioma. Yes, the astrocytic morphology can be easily made out here in the slide. The cells uh, are of... Um, variable shapes yes but they have a round to avoid morphology as you can make out okay there is variable degree of coarse calcification as you can make out in this figure b here okay uh, but this tumor is often confused with oligodendroglioma okay now why oligo because of the glial background and somewhat these uh, round to avoid shape but however, it must be noted that the calcification present in an oligodendroglioma is uh, quite um, uh, my focal and micro calcifications are often noted. They are much finer as compared to these coarse calcifications that you can make out here. In addition, it must be noted that uh, the tumor that is the uh, oligodendroglioma usually harbors a characteristic 1P19Q core deletion and uh, often an IDH mutation, that is either an IDH1 or an IDH2. But this tumor, that is plenty, that is polymorphous low-grade neuroepithelial tumor of young, which is also a LIAT for that matter, does not harbor any IDH mutation or 1P19Q core deletion as seen in oligodendroglioma. Rather, it shows a characteristic CD34 positivity, which is so diffuse and strong, right? So coming to angiocentric glioma, this is another pediatric diffuse low-grade glioma that occurs typically in the cerebrocortical location. And uh, it shows a characteristic round to ovoid morphology, somewhat a bipolar spindle cell morphology. Characteristic angiocentric pattern is noted in this tumor. Okay, uh, 
uh, with the tumor cells surrounding the blood vessels that is the typical cortical blood vessels are involved sometimes you can even have pseudo rosettes and subpile palisading that can be noted but it must be noted that this is a characteristic who grade one tumor okay the characteristic feature is the angi angiocentric disposition of this tumor now coming to the grading of adult gliomas now moving on to adult gliomas the adult uh, gliomas can be astrocytoma idh mutant which can either be who grade 2 3 or 4 oligodendroglioma idh mutant 1p19 q co deleted which can either be who grade 2 or 3 or it can be a glioblastoma idh wild type which is obviously who grade 4 now, IDH wild type astrocytoma without histological features of GBM, okay, but having a characteristic one or more of the three parameters enlisted, that is either a third promoter mutation or an EGFR amplification, or for that matter, gain of seven, loss of 10, okay, should be classified as glioblastoma IDH wild type or astrocytoma idh wild type with molecular features of gbm who grade 4 okay so that is typically very important to note right so this uh, thing was also discussed in the previous class where we were discussing the recent changes in the who cns5 so moving on now all idh mutant diffuse astrocytomas can either be who grade 2 3 or 4 right if it is WHO grade 2, then what is that? It is a diffuse infiltrative glioma with IDH1 or IDH2 mutation, right? But lacks any anaplasia and there is absence of CDK and 2A, 2B homozygous deletion. So that is very important to note. On the other hand, a grade 3 IDH mutant diffuse astrocytoma shows a characteristic mutations involving the IDH1 or 2 pathway with focal anaplasia now presence of either cdkn 2a 2b homozygous deletion or necrosis or microvascular proliferation upgrades the tumor to cns who grade 4 idh mutant astrocytoma right so if we summarize the entire thing what do we see here we see uh, that diffuse gliomas can either be idh wild type or idh mutant IDH is typically IDH 1R132H that we take into consideration because IHC is available and this is the most common mutation that typically occurs. Okay, so if it is IDH 1R132H wild type, okay, with one or more of the following, that is either microvascular proliferation or necrosis or third promoter mutation or for that matter EGFR gene amplification or gain of 7 loss of 10. Okay, then that upgrades the tumor to a glioblastoma IDH wild type CNS WHO grade 4. So this is typically important. Okay, so it must be noted that any diffuse uh, glioma which is IDH wild type, okay, harboring any one of this, okay, upgrades it to the characteristic glioblastoma IDH wild type morphology okay and confers a diagnosis of glioblastoma cns who grade 4. now moving on to the idh mutant idh1 r132h mutant diffuse glioma with atrx mutation and tp53 mutation with characteristic microvascular proliferation and or necrosis is upgraded to idh mutant astrocytoma who grade 4 okay if it lacks these then that is a astrocytoma idh mutant cns who grade 2 or 3 okay that is cns either it is a diffuse astrocytoma or an anaplastic astrocytoma but this anaplastic astrocytoma like morphology um, who refrains from using it we now confer it as uh, astrocytoma idh mutant cns who grade 2 or 3 Okay. Now, if it harbors a characteristic homozygous CN, uh, CDKN 2A 2B deletion, then that upgrades the tumor to a astrocytoma IDH mutant CNS WHO grade 4. So, that also becomes typically important. Right? In addition, it must be noted that if the ATRX is retained and 1P19Q core deletion is occurring in such a tumor, then that uh, 
changes the tumor from a diffuse glioma to an oligodendroglioma IDH mutant 1P19Q co-deleted CNS WHO grade 2 or grade 3 depending on the morphology of the tumor, right? So now coming to the circumscribed gliomas. Now what are these? This includes pilocytic astrocytoma, pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma, high-grade astrocytoma with pyloid features, okay, subependymal giant cell astrocytoma, cordoid glioma, and astroblastoma MN1 altered. So let's discuss them one by one. Now what are the essential diagnostic criteria and the desirable diagnostic criteria? that have been summed up in this slide, okay, for circumscribed astrocytic gliomas according to CNS WHO 5. Now, pilocytic astrocytoma, as we know, that it has a characteristic biphasic compact and loose growth pattern with pyloid cytology and a low proliferative activity with or without Rosenthal fibers and or eosinophilic granular bodies. But it must also be noted that any pyloid astrocytic neoplasm with a solitary MAPK alteration such as a Kia 1549 or a BRAF fusion also makes it a pilocytic astrocytoma. So let's look at the morphology. Now this is a pilocytic astrocytoma showing a biphasic appearance. There are compact fibrillar uh, portions that you can make out with elongated nuclei and bipolar pyloid processes that you can make out. There is Rosenthal fiber and eosinophilic granular bodies that you can make out as well. There is a characteristic loose microcystic appearance of this tumor that is also characteristic of pilocytic astrocytoma. Now, this tumor typically occurs in children, but cases have also been reported up to the first two decades of life. It characteristically involves the cerebellum in 42% of the cases. Supratentorial region is affected, but just in 36% of the cases. Hypothalamus and brainstem in 9% and spinal cord in just 2% of the cases reported worldwide. Now, coming to the other entity, we have pylomyxoid astrocytoma. Now that is nothing but a monomorphous tumor with a characteristic myxoid background. Okay, often uh, there may be Rosenthal fibers and or eosinophilic granular bodies. Okay, but shows a characteristic angiocentric pattern that is typical of pylomyxoid astrocytoma. Or it must be noted that an astrocytic neoplasm with a pylomyxoid morphology and a characteristic Kia 1549 or BRAF fusion also makes it a pylomyxoid astrocytoma. So what do we see here? We see the characteristic angiocentric growth pattern of this tumor composed of monomorphous population of cell and there is a typical myxoid background that you can make out. Right? The cells have a characteristic elongated uh, process and there is a perivascular pseudo rosette like distribution. The tumor typically occurs in infancy and early childhood. Most commonly it affects the hypothalamic and or chiasmatic region. It is also a CNS WHO grade 1 tumor. So now coming to another entity that is pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma. This shows a characteristic pleomorphic morphology of tumor cells. There are multinucleated giant cells, spindle cells and lipidized cells. Okay, there is a desirable criteria that is presence of a characteristic mutation in the BRAF or other MAPK gene pathways with a combined homozygous CDKN2A2B deletion. A DNA methylome profile of a pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma has also been recommended by the recent WHO in CNS WHO 5. So moving on to this tumor, this is a pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma. The cells are looking very pleomorphic. There are multinucleated giant cells that you can make out in addition to the spindle shells uh, that are present in a fascicular growth pattern. Okay, this typically occurs in children and young adults and the site of predilection is mainly in the supratentorial region, preferentially involving the temporal lobe. Now coming to another entity that is SEGA. What is SEGA? SEGA is subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. 
The characteristic feature is multiple glial phenotype, including the polygonal cells, gemistocyte-like cells, spinal cells, and ganglion-like cells, and an immunoreactivity for glial markers, that is GFAP and S100, and a variable expression of neuronal markers, that is beta tubulin, neurofilament, synaptophysin, and NUN. Desirable diagnostic criteria includes a nuclear immunoexpression of TTF1, okay, lost or reduced expression of tuberin or hamartin, okay, because it is often associated with tuberous sclerosis, immunoexpression of phosphorylated S6 DNA methylome profile of SEGA, and a history of tuberous sclerosis or TSC1 or TSC2 mutation may be present. So if we see the diagram, we see that this is a case of a subependymal giant cell astrocytoma composed of large polygonal cells, okay, or elongated cells, resembling somewhat like a ganglion cell, right, with a characteristic prominent nucleoli as you can make out, okay. There is a bright pink cytoplasm and the nucleus is somewhat eccentric. Okay, there is prominent uh, nucleoli just like a ganglion cell. As you can see, presence of mitosis and vascular proliferation or necrosis does not upgrade this tumor to an anaplastic morphology. Okay, it must be noted that children and young adults, usually in the setting of tuberous sclerosis, seen in up to 5% to 15% of the cases, has been reported. It must also be noted that this usually presents as an intraventricular mass. Now moving on to another entity that is cordoid glioma. This is a glial neoplasm, okay, typically occurring in the anterior third ventricle and presents with a cordoid features. The desirable criteria includes TTF1 immunopositivity, okay, and the mutation in PRKCA. DNA, DNA methylation profiling aligning with cordoid glioma is also one of the diagnostic desirable criteria. So if we see here, what do we see here? This is a CNS WHO grade 2 glioma. It's a cordoid glioma. The cells are typically present in cords. Okay, they have a characteristic uh, round to ovoid to epithelioid morphology. Okay, and the background is mucomyxoid, as you can make out. Right. There may be characteristic lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate, russell bodies uh, that may be present in the peritumoral pyloid region. It typically occurs in the third ventricle and in the hypothalamic region. Usually it occurs in the middle aged women, okay, uh, usually the median age is 45 years, okay, and 63% of the cases have occurred in women. So 63% of the cases have been reported in the female population. Moving on to our last entity under the circumscribed gliomas, that is the astroblastoma MN1 altered. Now, this is a glial neoplasm with astroblastic perivascular pseudorosids and MN1 alteration. There is a characteristic DNA methylation profile in astrocytoma that has been reported. Okay, GFAP immunoreactivity and EMA immunoreactivity is the desirable diagnostic criteria. So now coming to the morphology of astroblastoma MN1 altered, note that no WHO grade has been uh, given to this tumor in the recent WHO CNS5. Okay, so no WHO grade has been assigned. It must be noted that this is a well circumscribed tumor with a characteristic pushing border. Okay, it has a high grade uh, morphology and it shows a characteristic perivascular pseudo rosetting similar to that of an ependymoma. However, the cellular processes are much thicker as compared to an ependymoma. Okay, there is vascular hyalinization and a little fibrillary background that you can make out. This shows a characteristic supratentorial or cerebral location and the tumor typically occurs in children and young adults. So now moving on to another important glial tumor that is ependymoma. Ependymal neoplasms occur at all ages and encompass multiple tumor types and subtypes. Okay, they typically develop in the supratentorial compartment, posterior fossa or in the spinal cord. 
the newly identified biological markers and classification schemes for example have been based on the characteristic dna global methylation profiling that have led to the definition of 10 types of ependymomas okay and an improved prediction of patient's outcome by applying the new classification system so this is a picture which has been taken from a very important publication in the brain pathology journal okay and um, what do you see here you see that the ependymomas have been classified as supratentorial ependymomas posterior fossa ependymomas and the spinal ependymomas we also have the sub ependymoma which is a characteristic uh, who grade 1 ependymoma showing a third promoter mutation or a loss of chromosome 6 on the other hand a supratentorial ependymoma can either show a zfta fusion or a yap1 fusion a posterior fossa ependymoma can either be type A or type B. Type A ones usually show a EZIP mutation or an H3K27M mutation. Type B shows a characteristic chromosomal instability. On the other hand, you also have a spinal ependymoma which shows NF2 mutation or chromosome 22Q loss. Spinal ependymoma MYCN shows a characteristic amplification in the MYCN gene on chromosome 2P. Mixopapillary ependymoma shows a characteristic chromosomal instability. Okay. Now the criteria for the diagnosis besides the uh, fusion, it is important to note that uh, mixopapillary ependymoma shows a characteristic papillary architecture and a perivascular mixoid change or at least focal mixoid change. There may be an immunoreactivity for GFAP and a methylation class of uh, mixopapillary ependymoma, however, has not been well defined. It must also be noted that a subependymoma is a circumscribed glioma. Clustering of tumor cell nuclei in expansive and focally microcystic or fibrillary matrix is characteristically located in subependymoma. Okay, so now let's discuss these entities one by one. Now, before we go into the discussion regarding the location, it is important to note that ependymomas typically occur in the supratentorial posterior fossa or in the spinal location. Regarding a sub ependymoma, it is important to note that sub ependymoma and mixopapillary ependymomas are exceptional as sub ependymomas can occur in all the three locations or compartments. And there is a vast majority of mixopapillary ependymomas that typically occurs in the lower part of the spinal cord involving the corda equina. Moving on to the histology, as you can make out, you have monomorphous population of tumor cells, usually round to ovoid with speckled chromatin. There is a characteristic perivascular distribution of these tumor cells, okay, and there is presence of ependymal rosettes. Okay, the true ependymal rosettes that you can make out, there is a characteristic uh, lumina, okay, and surrounding that you have tumor cells. In addition, there may be perivascular pseudo rosetting that can also be made out here. Okay. Now coming to supratentorial ependymoma. Supratentorial ependymoma now comprise either a ZFTA or a YAP1 fusion. If no pathogenic gene fusion that is either ZFTA or YAP1 has been detected in the supratentorial ependymoma, then it is referred to as a supratentorial ependymoma, not elsewhere classified. Okay. If a molecular diagnosis was not feasible or successful, okay, the tumor should be classified as a supratentorial ependymoma, not otherwise specified. Okay. So the not elsewhere classified and not otherwise specified have been discussed in the previous class as well. Now up to now the majority of the supratentorial ependymomas were classified as supratentorial RELA fusion ependymoma with the genetic fusions between ZFTA and RELA. But in the recent classification the newly defined ependymoma type that is the ZFTA fusion replaces the term supratentorial rela fusion tumors why this pays the tribute to the fact that the fusion of the zfta gene has been shown not only to occur with rela but also with other fusion partners like the mam l23 ncoa12 mn1 or ctnna2 
Okay, so besides Rela, there are other fusion partners as well, and therefore, it is now called as supratentorial ZFTA fusion. The second newly recognized category is the YAP1 fusion positive ependymoma. Such tumors typically harbor the YAP1 MAM LD1 fusion or the YAP1 FAM 118B fusion. Now coming to the posterior fossa ependymomas, ependymomas occur typically in the posterior fossa can either be PFA or B and if the diagnostic criteria is not met then it can either be an NEC or the NOC which is similar to that of a supratentorial ependymoma as described earlier. Okay. Now obligatory criteria for the diagnosis of a PFA that is a posterior fossa location and evidence of a global reduction of K27ME in the tumor cell nuclei is essential. If a global H3 K27ME reduction cannot be detected, okay, then a DNA methylation profile aligned with PFA can still secure the diagnosis of a PFA ependymoma according to the current WHO. Okay. Hypermethylation of the CPG rich islands and global DNA hypomethylation are characteristic of a posterior fossa ependymoma. So besides the global reduction of K27ME in tumor cell nuclei, okay, there is another important diagnostic criteria which if present can also be classified as a posterior fossa ependymoma type A that is nothing but the hypermethylation of the CPG rich islands. In addition, it must be noted that H3K27ME reduction is strongly associated with EZIP overexpression, right? Now coming to the spinal ependymoma, ependymal tumors can occur in the spinal location as well and they show a characteristic MYCN amplification. Okay, now uh, this amplification is very important because it is typical for spinal ependymomas. Besides that, mixopapillary ependymoma and subependymoma have also been documented to occur in the spinal location. The spinal ependymoma predominantly occurs in the cervical region followed by the thoracic and the lumbar. The median age group is around 41 years and the spinal ependymoma characteristically harbors chromosomal losses of chromosome 22Q where NF2 gene is located. So germline mutations of the NF2 gene usually cause a predisposition to neurofibromatosis type 2. Now spinal ependymomas can be either uh, spinal ependymoma MYCN. Okay, uh, now this is characteristically a very novel criteria. Histologically, this tumor typically shows uh, pseudo rosettes and has a characteristic papillary or pseudo papillary architecture. Okay, they typically display high grade features including microvascular proliferation, necrosis or high mitotic count. So that is why this uh, MYCN amplification in a spinal ependymoma is typically important because this, uh, these tumors usually have a characteristic histology of a papillary or a pseudopapillary architecture. Now coming to the mixopapillary ependymoma, now that is a morphologically defined entity as you can, uh, as you have already seen, all right. There is a partial aggressive clinical behavior and recurrence and dissemination that have been attributed to this tumor and therefore this tumor has been upgraded in the recent WHO from a WHO grade 1, okay, to a WHO grade 2 in the current version of the WHO classification. So as you can make out here, this is a case of a mixopapillary ependymoma with a characteristic radial distribution of the cuboidal to epitheloid elongated glial cells, okay, around hyalinized fibrovascular cores, right? So these are the hyalinized fibrovascular cores, okay, with a characteristic mixoid change, okay. Accumulation of a basophilic mixoid material uh, can be appreciated in this area. And this mixoid material is usually highlighted by pass or alcyon blue. So per iodic acid skiff and alcyon blue positively stains this mixoid material in mixopapillary ependymoma. Moving on to the grading of ependymoma, subependymoma are still classified as WHO grade 1 whereas grading of mixopapillary ependymoma has been changed from grade 1 to grade 2. 
According to the current update of WHO classification for uh, supratentorial posterior fossa or spinal ependymoma without any molecular specification, histological grading, that is grade 2 or grade 3 ependymomas, should still be a part of the diagnosis. So that remains unchanged, right? Now coming to the glioneuronal tumors and neuronal tumors, as we have seen that there is a long list of tumors encompassing the ganglioglioma's desmoplastic infantile gliomas, disembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumors, okay, gangliocytomas, central neurocytomas, and a long list, right? So typically it must be noted that glioneuronal and neuronal tumors are slow growing low grade neuroepithelial tumors with mature neuronal and less consistently glial differentiation. They typically occur in young adults and in adolescent age group and show a characteristic predisposition to epilepsy and therefore they have been grouped under the low grade epilepsy associated tumors or the LIATs. So this chart or rather this slide is typically very important. Why? Because the glioneuronal tumors here have been histologically defined. That is those which are mainly composed of ganglion cells. That is those cells which have an abundant amphophilic cytoplasm and eccentric vesicular nucleus with a prominent nucleolus. Such tumors are usually a ganglioglioma or a gangliocytoma, dis, uh, sorry, desmoplastic infantile ganglioglioma, multinodular and vacuolating neuronal tumors and dysplastic cerebellar gangliocytomas. Those tumors which are mainly composed of neurocytes include the central neurocytoma, papillary glioneuronal tumor, rosette forming glioneuronal tumor and diffuse leptomeningeal glioneuronal tumor. Those tumors which are typically composed of oligodendroglioma like cells include the dysembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumor or the DNET okay mixoid glioneuronal tumor and a provisional entity that is the diffuse glioneuronal tumor with oligodendroglioma like features and nuclear clusters okay so let's move into it one by one now discussing the important glioneuronal tumors we have ganglioglioma now this is a very important entity for all the postgraduate trainees it's a well differentiated slow growing glioneuronal tumor which is composed of ganglion-like cells and atypical glial cells. The ganglion-like cells demonstrate dysmorphic features like binucleation, as you can make out, there may be nuclear clustering, okay, and there may be cytomegaly with ballooning of the cytoplasm, right? Now, coming to the desmoplastic infantile ganglioglioma, it's a supratentorial tumor. Neoplastic neuroepithelial cells are seen in a characteristic desmoplastic spindled stroma. The tumor cells are arranged in a fascicular and storiform pattern and there may be small number of gemistocytes like cells and ganglion cells as well or rather ganglion like cells. Okay, the background stroma is variably desmoplastic and can be highlighted by trichrome or reticulin stain. So now coming to disembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumor. Now this tumor is composed of uh, cystic spaces which contain alcyon blue positive mucin. However, this is a HNE stain slide, right? So what do you see here? You see these cystic spaces which have mucin, okay, the bluish tinged mucin. And what are these? These are oligodendroglia like cells. Okay, and these small oligodendroglioma-like cells are uh, there with intervening neurons, okay, floating in this mucomyxoid matrix, okay, and these are referred to as floating neurons. So, if we see the high power of it, what do we see here? We see the floating neurons and we also see the oligodendroglioma-like cells. Moving on to diffuse glioneuronal tumor with oligodendroglioma-like features and nuclear clusters. So this tumor was not histologically defined but was identified in 2020 by DNA methylation profiling. It is associated with recurrent monosomy 14 as its genetic signature. The KI67 labeling index is quite high and most of the tumors occur in the characteristic cerebrum. Right? So cerebrum is the most important site. Oligodendroglioma like clear cells with scattered pleomorphic nuclear features uh, are the histological hallmarks. 
in addition ganglion cells or multinucleated cells calcification and fermi cells may also be present the critical point is that these tumors are negative for gfap and are often positive for olic 2 and map 2 so now coming to the immunohistochemistry that is essential for identifying the neuronal differentiation of the tumor. That is, we have MAP2, we have neurofilament protein or NFP, we also have new N and we have synaptopysin. Okay, MAP2 is a neuron specific cytoskeleton protein, okay, which is quite abundant in the dendrites and in the cytoplasm. On the other hand, neurofilament uh, is characteristically present in the ganglion cells and also in the normal neurons. On the other hand, synaptophysin shows a characteristic cell membrane positivity in the neoplastic neurons. Okay, while new N is the gene that produces the neuronal nuclei. Moving on to the genetically defined entities, we have the diffuse glioneuronal tumor with oligodendroglioma like features and nuclear clusters. Okay, that is DGONC. The location is characteristically the cerebrum. Okay, this tumor can either be WHO grade 2 or grade 3. Okay, but however, this is a provisional entity now. The recurrent uh, chromosome 14 has been associated with this tumor. On the other hand, you have multinodular and vacuolating neuronal tumor, which also occurs in the cerebrum, associated with MAPK pathway alteration. Mixoid glioneuronal tumor, which is again a grade 2 or grade 3 tumor occurring in the adults and in the adolescent age group. Okay, It occurs in the septum and is often associated with genetic alterations involving PDGFRA. We also have diffuse leptomeningeal glioneuronal tumors MC1 and MC2, that is methylation class 1 and class 2, both occurring in the spinal cord, often associated with Kia 1549B RAF and uh, mutations okay and they can either be grade 2 or grade 3 so if we summarize what we have discussed till now then we can find that the neuronal differentiation can be attributed based on the morphology that is either it is a ganglion cell like differentiation or a neurocytic differentiation IHC positivity either for synaptophysin or new N or NFP and based on the location, that is whether it is a cerebrum location or a septum or a leptomeninges, it can be divided into a multinodular vacuolating glioneuronal tumor, often showing a MAPK pathway alteration, okay, or a diffuse glioneuronal tumor with oligodendroglioma-like features and nuclear clusters, again occurring in the cerebrum, but shows a characteristic monosomy 14. It can be a mixoid glioneuronal tumor occurring in the septum showing a characteristic PDGFRA mutation. Often the differential diagnosis is a DNET in this case. Okay, or it can be a diffuse leptomeningeal glioneuronal tumor occurring in the leptomeninges showing a characteristic BRAF mutation and a methylation class 1 or class 2 phenotype. So now coming to the layered and structured reporting that has been advocated by WHO in this recent edition. It includes an integrated diagnosis that is a combined tissue based histological and a molecular diagnosis, histological diagnosis of the tumor, the CNS WHO grade according to the recent WHO grading system and the molecular information that has been gathered from several molecular assays that have been performed for the tumor okay so let's see an example now, this example was also discussed in the previous class first of all an integrated diagnosis of a supratentorial ependymoma nos has been given okay followed by that a histological diagnosis of ependymoma based on histomorphology has been given in addition a cns who grade has been ascribed to this tumor because of its anaplastic morphology, it was given a grade of grade 3. And molecular information is written as molecular test was not done. Why? Because of the lack of facility of the molecular test at the institute per se. So summarizing the session for today, 
we find that uh, cns who5 has taken a new approach to classify the gliomas glioneuronal tumors and neuronal tumors and has divided them into six different families as we have discussed first is the adult type diffuse gliomas now these adult type diffuse gliomas remember that chart that we had discussed can either be idh wild type or idh mutant now those that are idh wild type which characteristic microvascular proliferation and or necrosis or if it has egfr mutation or tert promoter alterations or for that matter it has a gain of 7 or loss of 10 then it is referred to as a glioblastoma idh wild type on the other hand if it is a characteristic idh mutant astrocytomas then those idh mutant astrocytomas based on their morphology and their genetic makeup can either be who grade 2 grade 3 or grade 4 coming to the pediatric type diffuse gliomas they can either be the pediatric type diffuse low grade gliomas or the pediatric type diffuse high grade gliomas showing a characteristic alteration in the histone pathway that is h3k27m altered or it can be an h3g34rv on the other hand there is also a pediatric type diffuse high grade glioma which shows a characteristic mutation in the receptor tyrosine kinase pathway we had also discussed the circumscribed astrocytic gliomas which included the pilocytic astrocytoma the pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma the subependymal giant cell astrocytoma the astroblastoma mn1 altered and the cordoid gliomas in addition we also discussed about the glioneuronal and neuronal tumors which encompassed a number of entities showing a characteristic ganglion cell like differentiation that is the ganglioglioma or the gangliocytoma the a disembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumor which showed the characteristic which showed the characteristic floating neurons and a mucomyxoid matrix was also discussed epidermomas per se had been classified based on their location that is the supratentorial the posterior fossa or the spinal epidermomas and even the myxopapillary and the subepidermomas were discussed it was to be noted further that the myxopapillary epidermoma has been upgraded from grade 1 to grade 2 because of a higher chance of recurrence further what is to be noted is that the choroid plexus tumors with marked epithelial characteristics have now been separated from this entity of gliomas glioneuronal tumors and neuronal tumors now who also has emphasized on the characteristic layered reporting or structural reporting system by adding the suffix of nos and nec which we had discussed in the previous class as well okay so just adding to that the fact that nos suffix indicates that the diagnostic information that is the histological or molecular information necessary to assign a specific who diagnosis is not available this provides an alert to the oncologist that the molecular workup has not been undertaken at the institute per se or has failed technically Therefore, in the example that we had enlisted just a few slides before, a uh, yes, a characteristic supratentorial epidermoma was given a suffix of NOS. Why? Because the molecular workup could not be done. An NEC suffix, on the other hand, indicates the necessary diagnostic testing that has been successfully performed, but the results do not readily allow for a specific WHO diagnosis as per the recent WHO classification. So, in that case, we use the suffix of NEC, right? So, this is how we summarize the entire thing of gliomas, glioneuronal tumors, and epidermomas. Thank you so much for your patient hearing.